Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining this webinar. Uh, it is a pleasure to host it here at Temple Law School, well, virtually here at Temple Law School. Um, I am Rachel Ribouche. I'm a professor at Temple. I work with our Center for Public Health Law Research, um, research projects related to reproductive health and abortion law. And we are here with four esteemed authors of very influential books on reproductive justice and health who will talk about their scholarship as well as offer insights on the Supreme Court's latest word on abortion rights, handed down yesterday, June Medical Services versus Russo. Just a couple of notes, this webinar is being recorded um, and we will save a little bit of time at the end for questions. So thank you first to the institutions supporting this conversation. Uh, Temple Law Center for Public Health Law Research, the FSU College of Law, and the Harvard Law and uh, Policy Review, which will publish a online symposium following the webinar, in which you can hear more about our panelists' uh, scholarship and work, as well as common, uh, commentary by leading reproductive justice scholars like Aziza Ahmed, Maya Manian, and Seema Mohapatra. So, Thank you again to our speakers and moderator. I'm going to introduce them briefly and then I'm going to turn it over to our distinguished panel. Um, our moderator is Sarah McCammon, who is a national correspondent for National Public Radio. Thank you very much, Sarah, for joining us today. Delighted to have you here. Um, and our authors are David Cohen, professor of law at Drexel University Klein School of Law. He is the co-author of Obstacle Course, The Everyday Struggle to Get an Abortion in America. Uh, Michelle Goodwin, Chancellor's Professor, University of California, Irvine School of Law. She is the author of Policing the Womb, Invisible Women and the Criminalization of Motherhood. Carol Sanger, the Barbara Ehrenstein Black Professor of Law at Columbia Law School, author of About Abortion, Terminating Pregnancy in the 21st Century in 21st Century America. And finally, Mary Ziegler, Stearns Weaver Miller Professor of Law, Florida State University College of Law, author of Abortion and the Law in America, Roe v. Wade to the Present. And with that, I'm going to mute myself and turn the program over to Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. All right, thank you. Um, and thanks to our panel for agreeing to participate. It's a um, really strong panel. Some of the top law professors and writers in the country on reproductive rights and I've had the pleasure of interviewing uh, many of you, and I wished yesterday when I was writing about June Medical Services versus Rousseau that I could interview all of you, but in a way today I have that privilege. Um, thanks also to our online audience for joining us. We are really excited for this discussion and your questions. Just a personal note, I apologize for the hotel room in the background. Um, the good news is I'm at a hotel by the beach. The bad news is because it's because both the bathrooms in my two bathroom house had to be completely gutted thanks to a leak. So we're living here for a little while thanks to insurance. Um, that's fun anytime, especially during a pandemic. But uh, we're all here, all of us making things work remotely. So uh, thank you again for joining us. I do wanna to turn to our panel. Um, each panelist has been asked to spend a few minutes discussing your research and its connections with this case. And uh, Mary Ziegler, uh, since you invited me to moderate, I'm going to engage in a little bit of nepotism and start with you. <laughs> You've written a lot about the history of the political and legal fight over abortion. And you've written about how there are kind of two main categories of debate about abortion, one of which I would describe as essentially the moral debate and the other more pragmatic discussion about the impact of abortion. Um, I want you to talk more about those two major schools of debate as you see them and also how sort of the broader history of this debate connects with June Medical, which we just got the decision from today, yesterday. Sure. So um, in some ways, what motivated me to write the history I just wrote was, were cases like June Medical, where the court seemed to be, and the advocates really, especially abortion opponents, seemed not to be talking much about whether there was a right to choose or a right to life, but instead to be talking about what abortion was like um, and what abortion restrictions actually did. And so I wanted to kind of go back to the beginning to figure out why that strategy began. Um, and that really 
dated back to the Hyde Amendment um, when abortion opponents were trying then as now to ban abortion outright and finding that they couldn't do it by amending the Constitution. They came up with alternative strategies that would involve, you know, incremental restrictions. Um, and they had to defend those restrictions because they didn't ban any abortions or advance any right to life. So instead, abortion opponents began talking about what abortion was like for women in communities and families and what uh, abortion restrictions actually meant on the ground. And we, we saw a little taste of that in June Medical, but that dialogue, I argue, in the book reshaped how people talk about abortion both inside and outside of court. Um, and in a way, it's given a pretty powerful advantage to abortion opponents who can use growing d lack of consensus or a collapse of consensus about what fact is and what science is and a growing distrust of kind of public health authorities as a way to advance abortion restrictions. And I, I still think that strategy is very much alive, notwithstanding the Supreme Court's decision in June Medical yesterday. And I'm excited to talk about that with everybody on the panel and everybody who's joining us. Michelle Goodman, I want to go next to you. Great to talk to you two days in a row. You have written about the intersections of both race and gender in regards to reproductive rights and reproductive justice. When you think about this case through that lens, what do you see? So, you know, I see that the history of uh, reproductive health rights and justice actually extend back to an antebellum time. If we think about it, in 1851, I think it was, when Sojourner Truth met before a group of individuals in Ohio and she gave her famous Ain't I a Woman speech. What many people remember from that speech is one about the lack of chival chivalry towards black women and what they fail to account for is the fact that she said, and I bore 13 children and each one snatched from my arms and nobody heard my cry but God, ain't I a woman? And so this very case about what it means to be independent, autonomous, able to control one's own reproductive health and destiny is an issue that dates back to the antebellum time. And it's our failure to come to grips with that and understand it in the United States. Right now in our streets, we see a reckoning in America uh, about recognizing exactly what this history represents. The New York Times won Pulitzer's last year because of the 1619 project, or this year it was. But I think the important thing that I bring out in policing the womb and that we have to understand about this case is that this is Louisiana. You know, Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, these are the very, you know, antebellum slave states that are still doing this um, very apparent. I mean, it's, it's right in front of us, this kind of politi politicizing and po politicking on the wombs of poor women, particularly poor women of color. If you look at the data in Louisiana, the people who would be most impacted by this happen to be poor women and disproportionately women of color. And of those women, black women. And so when we think about abortion, I think that we have to understand that this is also part of a broader framework of the policing of reproduction and of black women in many different ways. And abortion is a very important slice of that. And in the book, what I do is to expand that and show the myriad ways in which the state now continues to come down on women's bodies and surveil them in ways that are quite uh, pernicious but have not been given the attention that it deserves in the broader media. Thank you so much. Uh, Carol Sanger, you have written about the history of abortion access in this country and the many obstacles women face. Um, Sarah, I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me. Is everybody having a trouble hearing me? No. There's a couple of requests for you to sp uh, speak up, Sarah. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn my volume. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, there may be a little bit of feedback. Um, does, is this better, though? Yes. Okay, great, great. Carol, both you and David Cohen, who I'll go to in a moment, have written about the history of abortion access and, and especially the many obstacles that women and other abortion patients face. Uh, in many parts of the countries. So I want to ask you, first of all, how you, you see this decision, this, the June medical decision, in terms of its impact on that question of access? Well, it's 
it's clearly a um, good decision. I mean, it's not a great decision, but it's a decision that certainly helps on the issue of access. Although when you see what we're cheering about, it's that now there'll be three clinics instead of one clinic. So it's not as though this is massive access. And in the decision itself, it includes a little map that shows you the distances um, women around the state will still be challenged with. So that there's a clear, uh, I mean, access is the, is the key. And there are a number of ways that access is, um, is made harder. And I think that even though one of the ideas in, in, in my book, which has a lovely cover, this is a face um, there, is that I think a lot of state legislatures know, as Mary said, that they can't ban abortion, can't criminalize it. But one view is, but we can sure make it harder for women. And we can make it harder and we can punish them by making them feel guilty, stupid, sneaky, a whole array of um, sort of negative internalized feelings that, um, that, the, that the law itself helps construct. So when you have a waiting period, for example, waiting period, you know, is touted as a, a, a time for you to, um, to rethink, you know, your decision. But what it means is because you're not smart enough to get it right the first time, we want to be sure you don't, you don't make this moral error. And so we're adding 24 or 48 hours on or the um, looking at an ultrasound. We're not really sure you understand what's at stake here. So we want you to look at that fetus that is your, yours. Um, so I think that the way that um, the idea we have about who has abortions is partially um, uh, is, is hindered by the fact that women don't talk about it. There's a great silence around abortion and there's a huge abortion closet and one theme, another theme in my book is that we ought to move from what is thought of as abortion privacy. I don't have to talk about this because it's my body, myself, my, my issue, um, to what I think a lot of privacy is masquerading at, which is secrecy. And I think the difference is people keep things secret when they think they'll be harmed if they let it out. And so um, it's that's that's one of that should be one of our goals is to make is to normalize the fact of making this decision. I come back to that idea in a little bit, but first of all, David Cohen, you also have written um, a large focus of your book, as I understand it, is obstacles to seek an abortion, not just outright bans, but things that sort of get in the way of legal abortion, uh, much like the Louisiana law that we're discussing today. Uh, does this case? do anything but uphold the status quo? No, I mean, it, it, it upholds the status quo in Louisiana, which is already one of the most restrictive states in the country with respect to abortion. In, in the book that you mentioned, I, I co-authored it with Carol Jaffe, who's a sociologist at the University of California in San Francisco, and ANSWER, which is a research group out there. Um, we titled it Obstacle Course because it really is an obstacle course for a lot of patients seeking an abortion in this country. And if you look at Louisiana, as Carol said, the victory we had yesterday, which is a huge victory, I don't want to diminish it, um, especially given how conservative the court is, the victory means that there are three clinics in the state. Any patient who wants to get an abortion has to go to the clinic 24 hours ahead of time, in person, get counseling, get an ultrasound, have the ultrasound read to the patient, even if the patient doesn't want it. If the patient is a minor, they have to get the consent of a parent or go before a judge. They can't get insurance to pay for it if they're on Medicaid. If they have an Affordable Care Act plan, they can't have their insurance plan through that cover abortion. Um, there is no telemedicine. So if you want the basic simple uh, uh, medical abortion, which is about 40% of patients in the country right now, um, you have to also go to the clinic. You can't be at a local health center and have the pill dispensed for you there. Um, so Louisiana already, and, and if you want an abortion after 20 weeks, you can't get it. So Louisiana is already one of the most restrictive states in the country with respect to abortion. It is an obstacle course for patients who want to get one. And yesterday's decision means that um, there will still be all of these obstacles. 
Um, there will still be three clinics, which is much better than one operating at half capacity, which is pretty much the, what the opposite result would have been yesterday. So that's a, a good victory, but it's still an obstacle course for the people of Louisiana who want to have an abortion. Mary Ziegler, I want to go back to you because we've written, you've written a lot about the history of the anti-abortion movement, the pro-life movement. Um, how do advocates articulate their support for these kinds of laws? Well, if you go back to Planned Parenthood versus Casey, um, that was obviously a reckoning for abortion opponents and the kind of general conclusion that most of the kind of larger, in my opinion, more sophisticated players on the anti-abortion side drew was that uh, the court would never overrule Roe unless the justices believed that women didn't need abortion to achieve equal citizenship. And the strategy became to show not only that abortion didn't make women equal, but that it made them sick. And so there are lots of laws in this vein. There, um, there are kind of mandatory counseling laws that touch on supposed risks involving everything from breast cancer to psychological trauma and suicidal ideation. Um, the kinds of laws you saw struck down in um, June Medical um, and in Holman's Health four years ago uh, were very much in the same vein. The idea being that abortion providers hurt women, that abortion isn't safe, and that abortion providers can't be trusted um, either to sue on women's behalf, which was an issue in June Medical, um, or really to perform abortion safely at all. Um, this strategy, I think, was designed both to improve the image of the anti-abortion movement at a time when um, clinic attacks were common and the murders of abortion doctors had spiked, um, but also to provide a, a kind of foothold for a reversal strategy. And I think one of the kinds of interesting questions going forward in June Medical well, is June Medical clearly, in my opinion, makes it more likely that abortion opponents will pursue laws that focus on fetal life. Um, like, for example, 20-week bans, bans on dilation and evacuation, there are lots of options. But there were sound strategic reasons why abortion opponents felt that they had to focus on these women, women protective laws. And I don't think those reasons have gone away. So one of the kinds of interesting challenges going forward is going to be whether abortion opponents can navigate that kind of contradiction where they sort of need to make arguments about women, but the Supreme Court has shown at least Chief Justice John Roberts has shown a distinct lack of interest in those arguments to this point. But I think it's also important to understand too that um, this history, whether we go back to the or early origins of our country or we go back just 40 years ago, that the platform for getting us here has largely been based on black women's bodies. So, you know, people think about this as just having emerged as a poof. No, that's not the case. Even after Roe v. Wade, it was made very difficult for poor women to have access to abortion. And there are Supreme Court cases that are rarely mentioned, Maher, Bill, and Joe, you know, in regard to this. Um, but even more specifically, in the, during the years of the Reagan administration, in the wake of what was considered the crack scare in the United States, there were black women being dragged out of hospitals in shackles um, uh, with bloody gowns and put in police cars, giving birth on prison toilets and prison floors because there were uh, prosecutors that were claiming that their fetuses had the same rights as children who were alive and using existing laws against these women during their pregnancies in ways that had never been thought of before. So a pregnant woman who might have utilized a, a non-prescription drug during her pregnancy singled out and targeted for drug distribution to a minor. Uh, child abuse and things like that, that was instantiating certain rights in the fetus that had not existed in any other space. And the reason why I mention this is because in, that inst in those instances, not just one, but across the country, in fact, in the state of Wisconsin, there was a law that was developed euphemistically called the Crack Baby Mama Law, which provided the opportunity for medical uh, providers to um, to recommend the civil confinement for uh, these women. And that was not just Wisconsin, but Minnesota and other states adopted these laws. But here's the point, which is that these black women were the canaries in the coal mine. And the second point with that is that the movement 
um, to support reproductive health and rights did not move to support those women. And had they, right, it was like ding, 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 look at what this means. But the fact that these were poor black women, they did not represent the poster women, if you will, for the movement. And so if one really wants to look at when this chipping away began, it was then. And that was when, you know, real investment in securing reproductive health and rights was really important and it was a missed opportunity. And I think that that's recognized now. And the last point that I'll make with that is that we also see certain levels of hypocrisy that have been based in that time. When you think about it, the ways in which black women were derided as bad mothers, as inattentive mothers and all of that, and then look today at the opioid scare in the United States, very different kind of response and reaction. Instead, what we see states doing is suing the companies that manufacture opioids. How dare they have done this to those communities? Very different from the response. And I think it's really important to tie in that historical marker. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think if you, I think this is one of the kind of common themes in all of our books. Um, the Hyde Amendment is really important. And Michelle is absolutely right that there wasn't much emphasis put on it historically. Um, Anti-abortion groups understood its power, but abortion rights groups were focusing on other things like this sort of long shot constitutional amendment, uh, partly because it was poor, primarily black, but predominantly non-white women who were being affected. And I think that the Hyde Amendment's important to pr probably all the stories we have to tell. Yeah. Michelle, and tell us too. <laughs> right, go ahead. Now, I was going to say, and the Helms Amendment too, right? And so when we think about this, I mean, you know, Hyde, we understand that domestically, but Helms was the international law, again, handcuffing women abroad. If, in, if your country receives uh, aid from the United States, here are the ways in which we can limit and constrain the rights of women in your country to access reproductive health care services. And though, that, though there were members of Congress who did not support that, even Nixon was against that, you know, still we see that it's a kind of exportation of these shackling uh, policies that are geared towards women of color, whether it happens to be domestically or abroad. And it's stunning our failure to look at that squarely for what it is. Statistically, we know that this happens to be the case. I want to come back to the idea of uh, some of the ways that, as Michelle touches on, pregnancy and pregnant women, sometimes their actions are criminalized. Um, and if we have time at the end, I'd like to talk more about sort of the, the next stages of the fight over abortion rights. But I want to go back for a moment to June Medical and, and ask a big picture question for whoever wants to take it, which is, Given the result we saw yesterday and the similarity between June Medical and Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt from four years ago, why do you all think, and I'd love to hear from each of you, why do you think the court took the case in the first place? So I'll start. I mean, I think the Fifth Circuit forced the court's hand here. I don't think the court <laughs> wanted to take this case, but what happened was that after uh, Whole Women's Health, um, the Louisiana law was challenged. It had already been in the works while Whole Women's Health was being litigated. And um, like other courts around the country, it would have made sense for the Fifth Circuit to have looked at the Louisiana case and seen that it was identical to the Texas case from 2016 and followed the Texas case and struck it down. But the Fifth Circuit, um, in a two to one ruling um, with two very conservative judges in the majority, um, basically flouted the Supreme Court precedent and said, this is a totally different law, even though it was identical. It has totally different effects, even though the effects were identical. Um, and so it's constitutional. Um, so that put the court in a position, the Supreme Court in a position where if it wanted to um, uphold its authority as a superior court to bind lower courts, it had to take this case. Um, and I think that's what we saw from Chief Justice Roberts. That's why he ultimately, I mean, he granted, he was, there had to be five justices to grant the stay, um, which halted the Fifth Circuit opinion from taking, ever taking effect. Um, so he voted with the liberals to halt back a year and a half ago. And he voted with them yesterday because I think ultimately he thought this was a threat to the court's authority. I don't think 
absent the Fifth Circuit ruling the way it did, the court would have wanted to take basically Whole Woman's Health 2 just four years after Whole Woman's Health 1 was decided. I think it would have wanted to take a different case about a different type of restriction um, to be the next abortion case to maybe start whittling away as the conservative court probably wants to. Um, but I think the Fifth Circuit forced its hand this, on this issue. And on that note, here's what uh, Justice Roberts says as he concludes his concurrence, which is probably not the words that he ever would have wanted uh, to put in a Supreme Court uh, opinion regarding abortion, because let's be clear, he has not been a friend on reproductive health and rights or LGBTQ issues. But he said, stare decisis instructs us to treat like cases alike. The result in this case is controlled by our decision four years ago in validating a nearly identical Texas law. The Louisiana law burdens women seeking pre-viability abortions to the same extent as the Texas law, according to factual findings that are not clearly erroneous. For that reason, I concur in the judgment of the court that the Louisiana law is unconstitutional. And I think that for the most, most part, what we see is that the legitimacy of the court was at issue and the legacy that Roberts wants to leave behind. I mean, let's be clear, during the last few years, Roberts has had to state publicly that there are no such things as Trump judges, as Obama judges, or Bush judges. That is because the credibility of the court has been on the line and that's not been articulated just by journalists or scholars. That's also been a question that's been raised by judges and even at least one justice on the Supreme Court. I'm laughing a little bit because yesterday someone said, so, uh, ask me, so is Roberts a, um, a closet liberal? And I said, no, he's an out conservative. Um, he, 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 he took a very traditional view on um, stare decisis, which was good, um, that, that, that may have more mileage in it. I mean, there's a lot of talk now about how, how good a doctrine is stare decisis, but we got a little bit out of that, a little more out of that. Um, but, but I agree with David that this, that this would not have been the court's cup of tea by any means. And let's also be clear what second class citizenship means in this case, right? So in recent years, uh, people who care about the full scope of the Constitution um, as applying to all of us and that equal opportunity, uh, that due process, that the benefits and fruits basically of what's good about our Constitution, that it should apply to us all, for those who are concerned about that, then they're concerned really about this court. And they're also concerned then about what second class citizenship means. There's a way of reading June Medical as a second class citizenship case. Here's what I mean by that. It's a victory because it was quite possible that the case could have come out a very different way, which would have only heightened um, the legitimacy or at least the aggressive tone and tenor of anti-abortion laws. But here's what it reminds me of. It reminds me of the victories during Jim Crow, which were really not quite victories at all. I think within the educational arena, for example, Southern states uh, found that, well, what we can do, given that the Supreme Court is on this move for desegregation, what we'll do is just pay for black students to be educated in a different state. And so we'll send those off, those who wanna to go to law school in Texas and in Mississippi and other places, we're still going to keep those places closed. We'll just send you someplace else. Now it's not a direct analog, but it is an analog about what it means to be a second class citizen. And so while there are so many celebrations about this case, I think it's really important to recognize what it is that Professor Sanger has said, which is that, Let's be clear about what this means in the state of Louisiana. It still is quite burdensome for a person to be able to access this constitutional right. It is one that still makes it virtually impossible for a number of people. Abortion rights still seems out of reach. And for those who may be able to have it within reach, 
Let's be clear that cases like this and the laws that underpin them basically suggest that women do not have the sensibility, the capacity to think on their own and make these decisions about their health. And we don't apply that same kind of reasoning when it comes to men and thinking about virtually anything. But somehow we have it embedded now in constitutional law that women are weak-minded. This is the same kind of stereotypic thinking that was embedded in Supreme Court jurisprudence more than a century ago. So if you look at it that way, we've made really slow progress. I have to point out as a journalist who covers this that you know opponents of abortion rights would say that they believe that fetuses have rights and that there's a, you know, a moral debate there. Um, I, Mary Sigler, I want to ask you, because again, you've written a lot about the history of the anti-abortion movement. I think a lot of people in that movement were hoping that this case would be an opportunity for the court to go a different direction to, obviously, to revisit this question and to allow states to regulate abortion providers um, even if it meant regulating them out of business. Why do you think that the court took this case? Was it about a legality or was there ever a chance that we were going to see a different result here? Well, I, I certainly think the court's four conservative members were hoping for that. I mean, one of the tells for that for me was the fact that the court agreed to hear this question about standing, um, the idea that abortion providers shouldn't have third party standing to sue on their patient's behalf. I, I don't think that the liberal justices or Chief Justice Roberts felt compelled to take that question. I think there were probably at least several conservative justices who were not sure what Chief Justice Roberts would do, but were hoping that he would use this as potentially a suboptimal opportunity to begin chipping away at abortion rights, but an opportunity just the same. Um, I think it was probably unwise in some ways for them to proceed that way because this was asking Roberts, who as Michelle was saying, is very publicly declared that the court is not a partisan institution to do something that would look fairly partisan and would damage not only the court's legacy, but his own legacy. Um, I, I still think, though, that abortion opponents have been, in my opinion, kind of um, overly optimistic about how quickly the court would move on abortion, um, which explains some of the um, really sweeping bans we saw in 2019 and really just more recently as well with Tennessee. So I, I do think that there were um, votes from either side of the aisle, if you will, in the court to take this case, um, in part because before June Medical and to some extent after June Medical, no one is exactly certain what Roberts is going to do when it comes to the future of abortion rights. Quickly, Carol Sanger, if I could, I want to talk about this issue of standing. Now, it's not the sexiest mm -hmm. question, I guess, that this case raises, No, It is an important one. It's one I heard about as I went to Louisiana and talked to particularly the anti-abortion rights side of this debate. Um, they were very hopeful that the court would rule differently on the standing issue. Can you summarize for us, because I know you've written about this or are interested in this, what was the question here and what was its importance? The question was, were the doctors in the case eligible to, rep to be the plaintiffs? There's a what's called a prudential rule that's a matter, it's not a constitutional rule, it's a matter that the court has decided itself, that you have to have certain qualifications if you're, if, to represent the interests of someone else. And so the doctors were also were representing their own interests in that they were the ones who the regulation was about. They had to get uh, admitting privileges, but they were also representing the constitutional rights of women patients. Um, so the question was, were they qualified, were they eligible to do that? And there are a set of rules about what it takes to have standing for someone else when you're making someone else's argument. And one of them is that you, um, uh, you have an alignment of interests. The court wants to make sure that whoever is representing the women will fight hard for their case. And um, and and so that was that was an issue that both um, Justice uh, Gorsuch and Alito took up, and said the doctors shouldn't be able to be the plaintiffs in this case because they have a conflict of interest with the women patients. So how is that? Well, you have to 
you have to unwind it a little bit and see that what their argument was, was that the statute itself, um, um, 620, said, uh, what the, the state said, the purpose of that is to improve health for women because we're going to make doctors get admitting privileges and getting admit, admitting privileges will serve as a super credentialing act. It will show that not only do you have a, a, a medical license, but you get this added thing that a hospital says you're good enough to get their, their, uh, their, their admitting privileges. And so they say they don't want that. So they're opposing a law which is enacted for the good health of women. It's a kind of, it's very interesting argument that they make that there's not an alignment of interest between a doctor and his or her patient, but they're at, at odds. And the court said, no, we, the, the majority said, um, pluralities, we're, we, we always allow, we have always allowed doctors to represent the interests of abortion patients because we find, because they're best positioned to know um, what women suffer by virtue of these various restrictions. And so they, they didn't buy that standing argument. In addition to the fact that the state of Louisiana had said five years earlier, oh no, they definitely have standing. And so the court said, you waived your right. You, you can't just come in five years later and say, oh, we have, we have a kind of new argument. And the court said, this is not a new argument for you. You agreed that that was all right five years ago. So we don't disrupt the, leg the litigation this way by adding in a serious new argument at this stage of the, of, the, of the case. So it's really, but what it's interesting to see, it was a chance for um, three of the, of the conservative judges to get a little action going with how doctors are really not after women's the, the good the good health of women. They've got other motivations. They're, they're interested in getting their bill paid, but they're not, it was another way of, by stating that doctors had a conflict of interest with their patients, was another way of sort of roiling that pot. Um, and, and so they got some rhetorical advantage out of it, although they lost. Uh, court that decision about standing mean for future abortion litigation. It means it's very good that the case came out the way it did. I mean, we would be singing a different, you know, it wasn't the greatest victory because Roberts cut back a little bit on something in Whole Women's Health, which maybe we could talk about. But it means that um, it seems to me just solidified by a five to four vote, our standard rules on standing, our basic rules on standing. This was, that would have been quite an upset to precedent if they had said the doctors didn't have third party standing to represent the patients. But also on this note, I think oh, it's important uh, to understand two important factors. Um, and as journalists hopefully are watching this, that they, or that they may too uh, engage in these two important points, which is one, to understand the underlying medical science. So we know that abortions are incredibly safe. The World Health Organization has for many, many years compared the safety of an abortion to a penicillin shot, right? A person is 14 times more likely to die carrying a pregnancy to term than by having an abortion. And we can go down a laundry list of data that just shows that compared to a host of outpatient surgeries that an abortion is far safer, tonsillectomy, uh, colonoscopy, on and on, right? So, so we know that there is something that is a kind of pseudo argument behind this, but I'd also like to point attention to, to mm -hmm. which also shows that we're in a, a land of, of chasing after things that are actually not grounded in health and science. So many years ago, the federal government passed a law called EMTALA. It's the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act. It's a federal law that requires anyone coming to an emergency department to be stabilized and to be treated regardless of their insurance status, the ability to pay, who their doctor is, or any of that. So when states say, oh my gosh, for the betterment of women, we have to make sure that their doctors have admitting privileges within 30 miles because if something goes wrong with the abortion, then they'll just, what? They'll just die. A hospital won't admit them. They won't be able to get services. And that's just simply not true. It is not true. The very reason why Congress actually enacted 
EMTALA was not based on saving women from abortion, but it was saving women who were in labor with their pregnancies because hospitals were dumping these women, putting them in ambulances and these women being dropped off in any willy nilly place. And so we have to understand that the very debate that we're having, the debate that the Supreme Court has had on this in the Fifth Circuit really makes no sense after all, because any hospital has to take these women, any person, who is in an emergency status after any procedure or non-procedure. And I would just note from my reporting that one of the arguments supporters of this Louisiana law made was that women should be able to have the same physician who treated them for the abortion be there if they need, in the very, very rare case that they would need to go to an emergency room. But to Michelle Goodwin's point, uh, we should just note that several major medical groups, including the American College of of obstetricians and gynecologists and the American Medical Association and many others uh, wrote amicus briefs, as you all know, in this case, opposing the law and saying that these kinds of restrictions are not medically necessary. So none of us are doctors here, but as a journalist who's written a lot about the, some of the science of this, I, I do feel like I need to note that. Um, I would I simply note it as a bioethicist, right? So mm -hmm. my work is in, in bioethics, and, and that is just absolutely ridiculous. We could say the same is true for a person who's having a heart attack or any other kind of condition, but we know that it, in fact, would ne never make sense to say, well, a hospital, if there's someone in medical distress with their heart, the person can only be seen, or the best way for that person to be seen is with their cardiologist. That just simply doesn't make sense. And what it does is carve out exceptions with regard to women that do not apply. Women in reproduction that don't apply in any other space of medicine. There's one other little science point, which is 40% of abortions now are done by medication abortion. And the whole point of that is that you go home, you might have to take one at the clinic, then you go home. And your home may not be 30 miles from the clinic that the doctor had to get the admitting privileges from because that was from a radius from the, the, the clinic to the hospital. So that's just, just silly. It doesn't, you could, I think a seventh grader could figure out what's wrong with this statute and is it good for, it, it, does it accomplish what it means to do? And that's another, the technology of how exactly. Right. Just one last point, and I know we have to get mm -hmm. on to other questions, but to that point, Carol, again, the underlying message, because there have been states that seek to impose restrictions with regard to medication abortion, but the subtext is that, of that is that women lack the mental capacity to be able to take pills on their own when they get home, and yet there are people doing dialysis at home with machines, right? So across various areas, the subtext of so much of this is having to address the fundamental question about how we understand women's capacities and equality as rooted and founded within our constitution. Before we get to audience questions, and I do want to save a little bit of time for that, David Cohen, I want to quickly ask you, what do you see as the biggest differences between the June medical decision and the whole women's health decision of four years ago, which of course was regarding such a similar law from Texas. Well, because Justice Kennedy wasn't on the court, the fifth vote came from Chief Justice Roberts, as we've talked about. And his opinion is um, basically says, I completely disagree with whole women's health, but I'm going to apply the specific holding of the case that this kind of law is unconstitutional. But he says, I don't agree with the test from Whole Woman's Health. So he, he applies stare decisis, he applies precedent for the specifics, but not the rule. On the rule, he says that he doesn't think we should balance the benefits and the burdens of an anti-abortion law, which is what Justice Breyer wrote in Whole Woman's Health and wrote again in his plurality opinion. In, he says the benefit of the law is almost irrelevant. Um, we are going to take the state legislature's word that the law is beneficial and then move on. From there, all we have to determine is whether the law places a substantial obstacle in the path of someone choosing to have an abortion. And he says this is truer to Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the 1992 decision, um, truer to the real meaning of Planned Parenthood versus Casey than what Justice Breyer did in Whole Women's Health. Now, the, the way Supreme Court decisions work, when you have a split decision with four justices, one justice, and then four dissenting, you're supposed to take the rule for the lower courts, 
um, from the narrowest opinion of the, in the plurality. Um, so that would be Chief Justice Roberts' opinion. And if the lower courts follow his opinion, I think it will give more leeway to anti-abortion legislatures to pass uh, anti-abortion laws. I don't think it will pave the way for abortion bans, like in Alabama, Georgia, Ohio last year, at six weeks or even conception. But um, I think lower courts might be able to try and say that, okay, well, Chief Justice Roberts wants us to return to Casey. So Casey approved a minor consent law. So that's still okay. Casey approved a 24-hour waiting period. That's okay. Maybe 48 and 72 hours are okay. Um, bans on abortion based on the reason behind the law, uh, the abortion decision, bans at 20 weeks or maybe 18 weeks, maybe some lower courts. I think lower courts are going to have some more leeway now because they're going to read Chief Justice Roberts' opinion and saying this court, if it doesn't change, um, with Chief Justice Roberts making the final decision here, he will approve some of these things where Justice Kennedy might not have, although I think Justice Kennedy gets a little too much credit here because as he left the court, he joined Whole Woman's Health. But for the most of his career, he approved almost every anti-abortion restriction that came before him. Um, so he was considered the swing justice, but he wasn't that much of a swing. Um, and I think Chief Justice Roberts might be the same. Now, keep in mind, we have an election coming up in November. And just like we know that uh, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer are over 80, um, Justice Thomas is in his 70s. Justice Alito is, I think, there as well. Um, you know, it's not only the liberals who are getting older and might have health problems. It's also conservatives, too. So the court could flip. Um, in my most optimistic days, I think I dream of a world in which the court flips in the next year or two. Um, and we're not talking about Chief Justice Roberts as the swing vote. Um, so that could change too. And I think we have to, as much as that seems unlikely right now, hope for that in the future and plan for it as well, because that could be the case. So we have about <laughs> 10 more minutes. I do want to take some audience questions. And conveniently, I see a question uh, from a participant, which is very similar to a question I wanted to ask anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and take that as my, my opportunity here. Um, the questioner says, thanks so much for this session. Can you talk more about the roadmap that Roberts lays out in his concurring opinion to further curtail abortion access? What types of restrictions would be most likely to be upheld by the Roberts court in the future? And uh, Michelle Goodwin, when we talked yesterday, you talked about how this sort of takes away maybe one particular strategy for curtailing abortion rights. You touched a moment ago on criminalization of certain behaviors by pregnant women. I wonder if that is one piece of what the future puzzle looks like. I'll start with you. What do you sure. see going forward? Well, so there has been such robust strategizing on the part of anti-abortion movements. And so, you know, remembering in Whole Woman's Health, the court just dealt with two of Texas's trap laws. There are so many others, and we see these across the country. So there will continue to be physician and hospital requirements. Um, 40 states require an abortion to be performed by a licensed physician. 19 states require abortion to be performed in a hospital after a specified point in the pregnancy and so much more. And you can find a lot of this on Goodmarker's uh, website. Um, we'll continue to see a rise in referenda that relate to granting constitutional rights to fetuses in Alabama. A referenda uh, went forward uh, that now creates personhood in fetuses in Georgia just a few years years ago, a law that might have seemed innocuous related to adopting embryos that are cryopreserved. Well, it was a bit more than that because the person who sponsored the law after it was enacted said that this was a real victory because it gave embryos the same constitutional rights as women, right? And so you'll see from that space, you know, constitutional rights of the people perceiving that embryos have the same constitutional rights as women, to more kinds of trap laws that might involve um, matters that relate to doctors outside of admitting privileges. And also uh, for clinics, we saw a lot of that goofiness taking place with how wide 
the hallways needed to be, how tall the shelving needed to be. I think we'll see more of that and we'll also continue to see more laws that seek to criminalize individuals during their pregnancy for things that we've seen like falling down steps, attempting suicide during pregnancy and so forth. And some of these may not be with the legislature passing laws, but may be through on the ground enforcement mechanisms that involve police, prosecutors, no law, but shaping the law themselves because of what it is that they do and then creating precedent with women taking plea deals, which is what we've seen across the country and in Alabama specifically. Uh Mary Sickler, where do you, you've written about the, the incrementalist strategy of the anti-abortion movement. So when one strategy fails, there are others. What do you, where do you see this going next? Um, I think my guess based on anti-abortion people I've studied would be things that are more fetal protective and that build directly on Gonzalez versus Carhartt. Um, that would have been probably what they wanted to do. Um, not all of them. There's kind of a division within the anti-abortion incrementalists about to what extent you go fetal protective versus woman protective. But there are two model laws out there that are designed, I think, to win Robert's vote. Um, fetal pain laws ban abortion at 20 weeks um, on the assumption that fetal pain is possible that early in pregnancy. That's a direct connection to Gonzalez that most medical authorities don't think fetal pain is possible that early in pregnancy. Um, abortion opponents say, well, a few do, and Gonzalez says that when there's scientific uncertainty, legislators can restrict abortion. Similar arguments are being made for so-called dismemberment bans, which ban dilation and evacuation, which is the most common uh, second trimester procedure. Uh, those laws, again, um, would force women to seek out unproven and probably unsafe alternatives, but because there's some sort of scientific uncertainty often produced by the people backing these laws, they can fit into the Gonzalez framework too. Um, something else I have my eyes on just because it's emerged pretty clearly as one of the strategies of choice this summer are laws banning abortions um, for reasons of race, uh, sex, or disability selection. Clearly important people in the anti-abortion movement think that that's an important strategy to use. Um, of course, this, the Supreme Court decided not to pass on one of those or deal with at least with the merits of that kind of law last year in the Box decision. Um, but clearly, I think maybe it was Clarence Thomas's really fun, I mean, if you guys have more time later, you know, eugenic dissent, but more likely they thought it was because there would be a majority uh, for um, upholding those laws. So I'm, I'm keeping my eye on all of those because I think there's good reason to think that a court that is committed to the appearance of precedent could uphold one or any of those laws um, while still kind of starting down a, a path to unraveling abortion rights. We have a specific question actually that's related to something you just mentioned. Um, this says the Fifth Circuit has been holding two cases from Texas, a fetal tissue disposition law and a ban on d &E procedures. Any predictions on what the Fifth will do with these? Do you see yesterday's opinion as a serious barrier to the Fifth finding both laws constitutional? Um, I think probably many people on this on this call know this, but the, the Fifth Circuit, of course, tends to be more conservative circuit than much of the rest of the country. Don't know who wants to take that. I'll just jump in really quickly to tie this with what Mary just said, which is the utilization of race and uh, disability and sex as a platform uh, in order to um, create sympathy for these laws that actually are um, quite sexist in their underpinning and come from uh, a lack of racial sympathy and, and empathy in, in these spaces. And so that's a very curious kind of turn. And in thinking about the Fifth Circuit, I'm doubtful that this in any way will slow uh, the Fifth Circuit's move in this direction. To understand the Fifth Circuit's aggressiveness in this space is to think that in the wake of whole woman's health, that the Fifth Circuit would allow June Medical to go forward, that the Fifth Circuit would ignore, as Justice Breyer um, mentioned in, in the case, that the Fifth Circuit, the, the district court, in this case had an even more robust record that had been established than in whole woman's health to understand in fact how much a burden upon women in Louisiana this would be. And so an even more robust record of 18 months of study and yet the Fifth Circuit still um, thumbed its nose at the Supreme Court. Well, that's incredibly aggressive. And as I've said in other spaces, you'd have to compare that to something like Brown v. Board of Education. And within a year or two of that decision, the state of Louisiana saying, well, that only applies to Topeka, Kansas. We, after all, are Louisiana. And so those, you know, what the Supreme Court says doesn't apply to us. 
that's my sense of Louisiana. And so I, I would be cautious um, even after this to think that it slows Louisiana and slows the Fifth Circuit. Okay, Carol, I see your hand up and then I know we need to wrap in a, up in a couple oh, minutes. I just wanted to say, it's gonna be very interesting to see what the effect of women choosing abortion is now um, in the pandemic. Mm. And I think that that's going to be a factor in possibly widening an understanding of why women choose um, abortion. There are a lot, there are a number of studies on the relation between unemployment and reproductive choices. And so I just put that in as a, um, a factor that we're in a time now where there may, there, abortion may seem a more prudent to more people decision. So I, that's, that's all. But to bring this to the Fifth Circuit, uh, you know, we had a bunch of governors who tried to stop abortion in the beginning of the pandemic when they banned essential, non-essential services. They said mm -hmm. abortion was not essential. And every district court and circuit court found that those orders were unconstitutional as applied to abortion clinics, except the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit <laughs> went back and forth with the district court over and over with the Texas ban on abortions, and it finally timed out because Governor Abbott, as we all know, reopened the state of Texas way too early, and we're seeing the spike now. But um, because he reopened it while the case was still being litigated, abortion clinics were able to start doing abortions, but the Fifth Circuit was having none of it. They did not care that this pandemic was meaning that people were having trouble getting a constitutionally protected medical procedure. They didn't care. They said, you can close all the abortion clinics in Texas under the guise of the pandemic, I think the Fifth Circuit is a rogue circuit, especially when it comes to abortion. And I don't think anything in yesterday's opinion is going to stop them. Uh, so, Rachel, our host, I think, has one more question before we go. No, just a, a concluding comment. And, it, and it, couldn't, uh, it couldn't follow better from David's comment, which is the Eighth Circuit also uh, thought that Arkansas was acting reasonably and completely deferring mm. to the state. And uh, in the COVID suspensions. And I actually think there is one bright spot uh, in uh, the concurrent, just, just one. And that is the kinds of public health information that the court relied on, both Ju uh, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Breyer, to say these laws clearly enact burdens. And then stating clearly in the opinion and restating in the concurrence, and this hurts poor women is something very different than the type of language used mm -hmm. in Casey. And even with the common sense approach of whole women's health, where supply and demand just was this magical phenomenon that closed clinics and opened them and then had these consequences. I think there is some will. I'm not putting all my eggs in this basket because I agree with all the comments here. But if I had to pick something that is uplifting from the concurrence plus Breyer's uh, uh, plurality opinion. It's a more rigorous look at public health, which the Fifth and Eighth Circuit did not do in the COVID suspension. So that was going to be my question, but David, you teed it up perfectly mm -hmm. as you always do. So thank you very much. First, thank you, Sarah McCammon. You have been an amazing moderate. Thank you so, so very much. Um, and thank you to our panelists. Uh, Mary, Michelle, Carol, and David, uh, your books are amazing. The world is lucky to have them, and thank you for particip participating in this webinar. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, this is being recorded. If uh, Just to, as a reminder, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to shoot me an email. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye-bye.